we know that when a baker opens up a cookbook, they find in it recipes, recipes of ingredients and instructions to make a sweet delight, which brings happiness to a person's palate. However, if we were to open up a different book, in this case, the Bible, we would find in it an even greater recipe, a recipe of spiritual ingredients and instructions for the sweetest delight that brings happiness to a person's immortal soul. And this recipe is none other than the Beatitudes, which is what we just heard in our gospel reading today. The Beatitudes can be looked at as a roadmap, if you will, for sojourners journeying towards their ultimate destination, which is ultimately the kingdom of heaven. And there is no coincidence that Jesus preaches the Beatitudes on top of a mountain, for he here is fulfilling the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Moses received the old law on top of a mountain, and he brought it down the mountain and gave the old law to the people of God. However, in the gospel today, the people of God go up the mountain and they receive the new law from Jesus Christ, who was there as the new Moses, so to speak. This is significant because it is teaching us that the new law is higher than the old law. This does not mean that the Ten Commandments of old are no longer in effect. It means that Jesus has come to fulfill the old law, as the original Greek term for fulfill means to render perfect. Now, speaking of perfect or perfections, in order for us to better understand the meaning of the Beatitudes, it would be beneficial for us to understand the essence and meaning of fruit. Fruits imply a perfection insofar as fruits are the last stage of a plant's growth. Fruits also produce a sweetness, a delightfulness that brings happiness, satisfaction to a person's palate. Well, the Beatitudes can be looked at as fruits insofar as they are perfections. They are meritorious acts of excellence. They produce a sweetness, a delightfulness, a happiness to a person's internal palate, which is ultimately our immortal soul. Thus, the Beatitudes can be looked at as a foretaste, if you will, a sampling of the sweetness, the del delightfulness that will ultimately be experienced in the kingdom of heaven. This is why the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 1717, when speaking about the Beatitudes, it says that they proclaim the blessings and rewards already secured however dimly for Christ's disciples, referring to us who are still, still sojourning here on earth. Now there are several different beatitudes and I don't have enough time in one single hom homily to give an in-depth commentary on each one. However, today I'd like to just comment on a select few. The first one that I'd like to comment on is, blessed are they who mourn for they will be comforted. Many of the early church fathers had a common primary interpretation of what this mourning refers to. And they said that this mourning refers to mourning for sins. Saint Jerome once said, for the mourning here meant is not for the dead by common course of nature, but for the dead in sins and vices. Saint Ambrose once said, it is suitable that the third blessing, and he's referring to Saint Luke's version of the Beatitudes here, should be of those that mourn for sin, for it is the Trinity that forgives sins. 
We recall in the gospel, uh, the women of Jerusalem were weeping and mourning for Jesus as they witnessed him during his passion. Yet Jesus said to them, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. He was referring to the sins of Jerusalem, in which we know Jerusalem was ultimately destroyed in the year 70 AD because they did not repent of their sins. And so a good question that you and I could ask ourselves today is, do we weep? Do we mourn for our sins? Maybe not necessarily external tears, but do we spiritually weep for our sins? And one of the most powerful ways, that is one of the most powerful places to weep and mourn for our sins is in the great sacrament of confession. There we meet the merciful God and our mournful tears are turned into tears of joy. When we are there, we are in the shoes, so to speak, of the sinful woman in the gospel who washed Jesus' feet with her sorrowful, mournful tears and wiped them with her hair. Yet through her humility, Jesus said to her, go in peace for your faith has saved you. Another beatitude is blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Notice Jesus did not say blessed are those who desire righteousness. There is a distinction to be made between desiring something versus hungering and thirsting for something, which is typically associated with food and drink. Um, I could desire a Lamborghini, and if I don't acquire it, I could still continue to live and exist. But when I hunger and thirst for food and drink, if I don't acquire food and drink, I am going to die. Therefore, when Jesus is referring to thirsting and hungering for righteousness, it means that righteousness is an absolute necessity, just like how food and drink is a necessity. If we don't have righteousness, then we are going to spiritually die. And just like how for us, food and drink is no, not only just a necessity, but we make it a priority in our life, so much so Righteousness must be a priority as Jesus Christ himself taught in the gospel. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto it. Another beatitude is blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy a particular spiritual work of mercy that comes to mind right now for me when I hear this is to bear wrongs patiently. A practical thing that we can consider is for us to even look for excuses for other people's faults and shortcomings. Perhaps think of a person's history. Maybe they experienced a drama or trauma or suffering in their past or in their upbringing that may be a cause and a foundation for a person's particular actions and behavior. We recall our Lord himself set the prime example for us in this regard. As he was on the cross, he looked for excuses for his persecutors. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And of course, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We pray this prayer often. Let it not be lip service to the Lord, but let us pray it like we mean it. And of course, we have that beatitude, blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We recall in a different part of the gospel, Jesus said that no servant is greater than his master. 
Well, if Jesus Christ, who was the master, if he was persecuted, then it means that we, the servants, if we are truly, authentically, genuinely following in the footsteps of our master, our Lord Jesus Christ, to the T, in which we're called to do, this means that we too will also experience persecution. If everybody loves us, there is something wrong with that picture. We would have to question if we are compromising for the truth. Now, of course, if everybody hates us, that's not good either. Our Christian charity should be attracting people to some degree, so there should be some sort of middle ground there. As St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, that virtue always lies in the middle and that we should not fall into either extremes. So a good example of what I'm talking about right now is uh, when I was in the seminary, there was a professor there who would teach the seminarians that when you become priest and you preach your homilies, some people will say they love your homilies and some people will say they hate your homilies. Don't listen to any of them. <laughs> your job is to preach the truth and no less. Of course, you preach it in charity and love. And if you preach the truth and people persecute you for it, well, that's ultimately on them. You would be doing a disservice to the people of God for withholding the truth from them. And so a shining example of someone who was persecuted for righteousness is Saint John the Baptist. Recall he did not support, condone, nor celebrate Herod the Tetrarch's adulterous relationship as King Herod was uh, having his brother's wife. Because of his faithfulness, that is Saint John the Baptist's faithfulness, he was ultimately martyred. He was beheaded. But because of his faithfulness, he is now rewarded the kingdom of heaven. As we again heard our Lord himself say, for those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And of course, for those who persecute us for righteousness, we should pray for them as the Lord himself said in the sacred scriptures, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So my dear friends, this is just some commentary on some of the Beatitudes. May we keep that fire ignited by learning more about this great recipe that we have for the sweetest delight. And if we persevere in living out the Beatitudes by the grace of God and hope, may we enter in the kingdom of heaven to experience the sweetest delight, our Lord himself in the beatific vision, as Psalm 34 once said, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Thank you.